of the attempts to date to look at green development have very much sort of occurred at a project level or, or, or more so on, on specific initiatives. But in switching over to a jurisdictional approach where we do things on a much larger national scale, that presents some very different challenges, many of which we haven't really thought through yet or, or we're just for the first time starting to address. So the part of the point of, of this afternoon session is to really look at what are some, are some of the, the, the important challenges and the opportunities that shifting from a national approach, I mean, sorry, from a smaller approach to a jurisdictional approach actually presents. So on the basis of this, I'm going to hand over first to Ewan to, to open up the, the, the presentations. Yeah. And you feel free to do it over there or do it here, whatever you like. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to presenting here because there's some familiar faces. Uh, there's some old friends, colleagues. So hopefully you will be nice to me in the discussions. OK, so let's start about uh, how we uh, in Indonesia start thinking about the jurisdictional uh, approach. And I think uh, the NC as a host is like kind of the old friend when we are uh, developing a uh, jurisdictional approach through uh, program in Brau. So yeah, uh, when we talk about the jurisdictional approach, we talk like how Indonesia implementing Red Plus. If you're aware that in many international forum, we're calling that Indonesia will implement it, their Red Plus at the national level with the national approach, with the sub-national implementation. There's no, uh, till today, there's no specific uh, definition on what we call as a national. It can be from province, it can be districts, it can be forest management unit or KPH, or it can be in a project or combination, all of that. So, yeah, uh, jurisdiction support is implementation of Red Plus at sub national level based on the jurisdictional area as a basis. I think that can be very fluid definition. But that's what we are trying to do to make things more clear that what we call as a jurisdiction. And then also, this is the second point is like to answer like jurisdictional approach is a counting unit for now. And then when we talk about the implementation, we will doing it at the KPH, at the community forestry, hutan desa, hutan adat, and different kind of intervention. And then when we talk about jurisdiction, reference emission level, we're playing key roles here. So the, the reference emission level at jurisdictional level or at sub-national level will be part of the national one. And then the other point when we talk about jurisdictional approach, there's a lot of potential to integrate it, everything under one jurisdiction. It can be like a project in KPH, a project in Hutan Adat, Hutan Desa, so we can bundling it and then develop a common reference emission level. Yeah, and then now when we talk about jurisdictional basis, now, uh, Red Plus Agency start working at 11 provinces. And then you will question like, why not all the provinces? Why 11 provinces? Based on our calculation that these provinces represent like 70 to 80% of Indonesian forest. So we started working on these uh, provinces first. Please, uh, yeah. We start at Central Kalimantan and then now we're working at East Kalimantan, Jambi, uh, West Sumatra, and also already have uh, cooperation like in uh, Central Sulawesi, soon will be in Papua and West Papua, and also uh, for the rest of 11 provinces for this year, and the next year we will move to the uh, all of the rest of provinces in Indonesia. Please, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is the status of, uh, let's say, the readiness that we already have like 11 uh, strategy and action plan at the provincial level. They have a different approach, they have a different uh, situation, have a different challenges, but yeah, at least we have a strategy at 11 provinces as a basis. And if you know that, please continue. Yeah, uh, this is the phases we are uh, following. Right now, if you see that from 2013 to uh, uh, 14, actually start from 2010, we starting especially in the context of like what task force uh, doing and then uh, we now at the phase uh, 2A and then hopefully at by the end of 2016 we can 
saying that we graduated and then ready to be implemented. All the full implementation phase, result-based payment, we started uh, from there. And then we hopefully, by now and then up to 2016, all the instruments needed for entering phase three will be ready. Please continue. Yeah, please, yeah. And then this is one of the initiatives that we want to highlight it, how important the having integrated data, one database on forestry and the other sectors, especially uh, for the licensing as a basis for developing the jurisdictional approach. Yeah, please continue. Yeah, and then uh, this one also, we on the process making basic map at, uh, we started for previously at the five provinces, now we're trying to uh, six provinces uh, for this year. Hopefully by the end that we will have a wall-to-wall -wall, uh, good data to understanding better of Indonesian forests. Yeah, please continue. Yeah. And then uh, previously I'm also talking about how we dealing with the uh, hutan adat as a consequences or follow up of the MK 35 that we need to working and then how we can put hutan adat in our forest map and then how we can recognize of uh, their rights. And then another infrastructure that we want to uh, see is like how we can uh, build our capacity to facilitate conflict, how we can uh, develop conflict resolution process. And then we will start it at the five national parks. We in partnering with uh, TNC and then also colleagues from WWF who working in the national parks, how we can uh, develop standard operation procedures to solve uh, conflicts, especially at the forest area. Yeah, and then now we entering the district-wide approach. That's, if you see that we also working at the provincial level, that's why we developing our uh, strategy at the provincial level also, but we also have a good case at the district level. Why district? Because if we talk about the autonomy setting in Indonesia, the key authorities are in the districts, like uh, give a license, also let's say give a recommendation for the license from the national government, recommendation for like what you call as a masyarakat hutan adat, also from the districts. So there's a lot of real authorities in the district. So working at the district government level is a key ingredients for our jurisdictional approach. And then, uh, boleh mundur sedikit, yang tadi, ya. Yeah. Oh, no, yang tadi. Oke. Okay. Jadi, uh, so, in the district also right now, we already have some initial uh, initiative that already works as a modalities for us when we develop a jurisdictional approach that there's a lot of uh, process that will be done at the district level we in the BP Red Plus developing a Freddy funding, Red Plus, funding instrument for Red Plus in Indonesia. And also there's potential from the local budget in terms of like funding. Also, when we talk about the Burau and Kutai Barat, we have also like the FCA uh, program. So we have a lot of modalities to start with uh, working in the district level. Of course, the challenge is like how we can ensure that all the design from provincial district we can arrange in the right way, maybe it's like a nesting from national, provincial, district, KPH into the other level. And then, yeah, the district-wide program is part of the national frameworks and then how we can uh, ensuring that all of the intervention are aligned with the national priority. Please? Yeah, and this is some examples, like we talk about Brau as a beginning and then sorry for the other district maybe that I keep mentioning Brau because this is a very good case for us when we talk about the jurisdictional approach at the district level. And also Kutai Barat uh, as one of the samples. Now they divide it into the, the districts. One is uh, Kutai Barat and the other one is Mahakam Hulu. But now we also working uh, at the other five districts because as maybe you aware that we uh, have a plan to submit it our ERP in for a FCPF Carbon Fund, and then we, after selected from more than 20 districts, 
at five provinces that we come up with agreement like, yeah, these seven districts, it can be part of our ERP of uh, carbon fund. So we, the other district is like Bungo and Merangin in Jambi, Kapuas in Central Kalimantan, Donggala and Toli Toli in uh, Central Sulawesi. That that's what we have for now. But it doesn't mean that the other district is not important, but we need to thinking the whole uh, frameworks, especially for the result-based payment frameworks. And then we want to see that reward or incentive for the positive actions from the district uh, government or provincial government. Yeah, please. And then I want to close in that, that I think we can identify more than three points, but what we want to do is like at least we want to providing uh, support and facilitation process for provincial and district to build their readiness. And then the other one is like there's a lot of district thinking that we are ready to implement it red plus on the next phase. And then I think we need to start creating result-based payment frameworks and then creating incentive uh, scheme from the national government to provincial district up to the community. And then the important one also is like how to align jurisdictional approach with KPH. If you interact with the Bapenas colleagues, they will saying that no KPH, no budget. It means it will be national policy and then we need to considering this as one of the key intervention when we developing jurisdictional approach. And I do believe that jurisdictional approach, it can be like framing, and also it's like uh, bridging to aligning those intervention into more integrated way, which is we will be not scattered and busy to maintaining project to another project. So we wanna working in the big scales with the big ambitions. So JR or jurisdictional approach is one of the approach that we can use. Of course, this is not the only one. Thank you for that. Hopefully. Okay, thank you very much, Erwin. Um, Lex is going to present next. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. I uh, can't really tell if that's working. I think that's working. Um, yeah, so my name is Lex Hovani. I work for the Nature Conservancy's Indonesia program, and I'm going to present today uh, based on some of our experiences supporting Red Plus and jurisdictional programs in Indonesia as well as in other places. Uh, TNC has been working on forest and climate programs for about the last 20 years and working on jurisdictional programs for the last four or five years. Um, and we've been working really across scales. In Indonesia, we've been working a lot with the national government, provincial government in East Kalimantan and the district government in Barau District. And I think that perspective has been useful for understanding this, this kind of the complexities of this. And so I'm going to try to, to share some thoughts on basically uh, near-term and mid-term opportunities for moving forward with jurisdictional programs, even though there's a lot of uncertainty about how red's going to work and how green development and NAMA frameworks are going to work in Indonesia and in other countries. So just a moment on definitions. Um, you know, this is taken from a document that we did uh, several years ago with, with Baker McKinsey. Um, you know, we're talking about national level jurisdictional programs, sub-national level jurisdictional programs, and also nested programs where sub-national jurisdictions are nested within um, uh, national programs. Okay, and, and the, basically the idea is that if it's a jurisdictional program that there are, you know, carbon finance benefits and emission reduction payment agreements or performance evaluations done at the jurisdictional level and whether or not those are nested to true up to a national program. Okay. Um, so uh, four years ago, uh, TNC started supporting the development of a jurisdictional program uh, in Barau District. And the reason was, you know, it's pretty obvious if, if there was any chance of reaching a national scale green development or red program that, that districts would be key building blocks of that based on the fact that they control land use to a large degree through licensing, through spatial planning, and things like that. And so a lot of uncertainty about how it's going to work, but Barau and East Kalimantan were kind of key places based on their high for carbon stocks uh, and you know a lot of good uh, interest among political leaders. Uh, and so what we did was we, we <coughs> brought together a group of 
stakeholders from across sectors and from across levels to design this program, um, taking a pretty kind of broad approach. And the idea was, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about how RED was going to work. And first things first was to, to focus on getting a lot of land under effective management. Uh, and also to keep in mind the wide range of objectives that, that exist in the landscape, given the fact that you can't just focus on emission reductions without knowing uh, something about the per payment for emission reductions. And so better to create a broader framework. And this is what you can see there. And this program has been moving forward. Um, you know, the, the stakeholders involved in that uh, design you know, we're again a bit skeptical about carbon finance. Some of them having been through the CDM process where they were told they were gonna, you know, get rich from red, or not rich from red, get rich from, you know, uh, CDM projects. And so they basically wanted to take a, a more cautious approach. And so what they came up with was this, uh, which was to basically focus on building a jurisdictional program, the capacity to do spatial planning and development planning in line with uh, emission reduction and, and green development targets to develop uh, you know, outcomes to frame certain management outcomes on the ground uh, that could be, you know, framed in a, in a way that was somewhat generic and then could be later customized basically for different land man managers. So there's a lot of commonality among the challenges and the opportunities for reducing emissions from natural forest logging, for example. And so there's an ability to compensate uh, or to customize rather those incentive agreements. And then the idea was that if, uh, if, you know, if, if the program was able to influence uh, emissions across a broad swath of landscape by putting a lot of land under effective management, and if selection of sites was done in a good way, that would lead to emission reductions that could be verified. And then, uh, you know, that would enable the district to basically interact with a, a broad range of different sort of compensation frameworks, where it could be that the jurisdiction was interac interacting directly with the market or was, um, you know, receiving incentives from the national government. And so, you know, this initial kind of caution and framework turned out to be good because, in fact, four years later, you know, it's really kind of the same situation. We, you know, the program has moved forward in Barout to try to build out uh, some of these um, components, you know, and I'll, I'll mention some of those things. There have also been a lot of new additions uh, that weren't really anticipated, including Indonesia's quite ambitious NAMA commitment of reducing 26% uh, the emissions and called the Rod Gear Ka. And so you've got a lot of government agencies mobilizing around emission reductions. You've also now got incredibly ambitious commitments from some of the biggest industrial, uh, you know, uh, causes of emissions in the pulp and paper sector and the oil palm sector. So you've got companies committing to deforestation free palm oil. And so what I'm going to try to do is to kind of talk through how this approach and, and what we've been doing, you know, can be adapted to try to take advantage of the good progress that's being made by Indonesia in working towards its NAMA commitments and try to also frame these sustainable supply chain commitments in a way that really contributes to an overall uh, jurisdictional program goal. Um, I guess first thing I just want to highlight what, what, what we've observed in a bunch of different um, places, which is that there's been a really sig significant focus on readiness and on, on policies and institutions that need to be developed for red and on MRV and things like that, and there's been a big, em you know, big emphasis on impact, specifically emission reductions, and how would you measure emission reductions? How would you set reference emission levels? But those middle sections, the govern, what I'm calling governance outcomes and management outcomes, I would argue have been not emphasized enough, and and that's making this process a lot harder, and it's going to make it a lot harder to align these different interests and efforts. And so, just to give. Some more examples, I mean, governance outcomes, you know, for example, legal recognition of ADAT claims, right? So there's lots of focus on how would you do this, making plans, right? And government may have a plan for how to do this, but actually achieving it, you can, you can observe whether it's been accomplished or not. And so that's a governance outcome. Developing forest management units that are going to be on the ground, managing forests, you know, overseeing concessionaires, you know, establishing them is one thing. I would call that a readiness output, um, but a governance outcome, something that's like really going to lead to better management results is, is that forest management unit operating or not? And so defining what does it mean for it to be operating effectively, I would call a governance outcome. And I'd say that's a really, really key thing that hasn't been focused on enough. And so until we can get that uh, result chain, you know, really clarified in particular places, 
uh, we're going to have big challenges, but it can also present an opportunity because by looking at it this way, you know, we, I think we can find that there are management outcomes that people can agree on even though they don't 100% agree on the framework of RED versus NAMAs versus supply chains, et cetera. So um, I guess, again, you know, one of the challenges here, um, you know, the readiness phase, there's been good emphasis. Uh, you know, for governance outcomes, there really hasn't been much focus on how you would monitor whether or not governments are doing the things that they say they're going to do or that they plan to do or that they would need to do in order to, to really secure uh, good management results. And at the management level, you know, I think that we haven't yet been specific enough about, you know, for all the different land uses out there, what would need to change, you know, and how would you go about implementing that. And we, ha we certainly haven't been good in Indonesia or in Barao yet about uh, designing investment programs that can really be scaled up you know, based on those outcomes. And I'll just say quickly that on the impacts lev level, uh, you know, Indonesia and a lot of places have a big challenge in terms of not having a consistent framework for evaluating emission reductions, where you know, the NAMA framework that's been developed and the RED framework are not compatible yet. They really need to be, and there also needs to be a much bigger focus on nesting and clarifying how jurisdictions would be part of a coherent national program. So um, that paper I mentioned before that we had done previously put out a proposal on how that could be done. Um, but so far, they ha you know, no countries have really made a lot of progress on that as far as I know. So again, for me, um, when I think about what are our, our big opportunities, given the fact that RED is still very much in development and NAMA frameworks are still very much in development, I think you know, for jurisdictional programs like in Barao, where there's a you know a fair amount of mobilization of resources and and capacity, you know, to focus on these management outcomes uh, on in both production landscapes and in protection landscapes, you know, really defining clearly what are those outcomes that we want to see, you know, what are the governance uh, outcomes that are necessary to enable those, you know, how do those contribute to emission reductions? We just we haven't done it yet. You know, and I think that's really something that can be done in Indonesia to help, um, you know, to make all the, the investments much more effective is to work towards this more integrated results framework. Um, a couple examples from Barao. You know, there's been, uh, Pak Iwan mentioned a forest management unit. There's a forest management unit that's in development in Barao. It covers almost 800,000 hectares. You know, there's a, ma a major effort from GIZ and from uh, others to try to build up the capacity of that. Uh, Ministry of Forestry and Bapanas have been very supportive of that as well. Um, and that's going to enable, you know, real major strides in achieving management outcomes within that Kapeha landscape. A lot more work needs to be done, including defining, you know, what would a well-managed Kapeha really, or forest management unit really look like? What does it need to be able to do? How would you evaluate it, right? That, those discussions are starting, but they have a long way to go. Another one is for communities. So communities present complexities um, in, in, in red um, because of the, the issues around land tenure. Um, but it's very clear they need to be at the center of, of a, a jurisdictional program and the center of any real solutions. And so you know, we've been working towards defining some of the governance outcomes uh, that need to be achieved, including how communities can be involved in uh, program development and program oversight including how village planning frameworks can be redesigned to achieve low emissions development or green development uh, objectives. And then, you know, at the management unit level, within lands that communities manage, what are the outcomes? How would you evaluate success? You know, so we've made a, a fair bit of progress and have some good um, tools there, which we could talk about later if people were interested um, for how you would replicate that. Another area that's been a source of pretty big investment is looking at sustainable or natural forest logging concessions, uh, where you know they cover about 40% of the landscape, and there's already you know management outcomes that have been defined through uh, government certification systems, through FSC certification systems. So there's a, you know there's a, a a lot of context for this, but at the same time, you know when we looked at this in detail to see you know are these concessions that are FSC certified really reducing emissions compared to those that aren't? The answer was no. And there's a combination of reasons for that. But what it did was it led us to try to articulate, you know, what are the specific things, what are the specific management outcomes that you would need to achieve to actually make sure you're having those impacts of emission reductions that you want to have. And so we developed uh, working with 
um, Tropical Forest Foundation uh, VCS methodology for how you could do that in a relatively simple but credible way. Uh, so that's in development. But this could lead to significant emission reductions. It's a good example, though, of, of this idea of really focusing in and getting it right about what are the management outcomes that you want, being specific, and then trying to figure out, well, how are we going to scale that up? How are we going to incentivize people to do that? Blending, potentially, multiple sources of finance and investment. Um, so just to wrap up, um, you know, I think <clears throat> I tried to make the case for, the, for focusing on these, these outcomes in the middle. I'd also like to make the case for, you know, trying as much as possible to think about how you could, for jurisdictional programs, develop multi-phase agreements that capture, you know, investments from the readiness phase to the payments for emission reductions. And that would ideally include results-based payments for governance outcomes and management outcomes. The reason being, you know, those are incredibly important to making this work, to actually getting the emission reductions. You know, getting those outcomes is incredibly important to the sustainability of those jurisdictional programs. And it's also a lot easier to communicate about what are those outcomes to local governments than it is to communicate about emission reductions, which can be a bit uh, abstract. And so I think that's something that there are no, you know, carbon facilities out there yet that do this. And so I think what we need next uh, is, you know, that, that jurisdictional programs can try to start figuring out how would you blend multiple financing mechanisms uh, to create that kind of integrated framework where different financing mechanisms are potentially financing, uh, you know, results-based payments targeted at different phases uh, as appropriate. It would take a, a it would be a challenging thing. It, it would need to be done across scales. Also, given the fact that no jurisdiction can really control land use completely, even though districts have a lot of control, they don't have complete control. So this is, would be a complicated process, but I think it's pretty necessary, and it would be a critical step on the path towards a point where jurisdictions were able to actually make long-term agreements and commitments about protecting carbon stocks with confidence about the permanence of, of those agreements. So uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, okay, no problem. Where, where do you want me? Wherever you want me. <laughs> wherever, you, wherever you feel comfortable. Well, I already finished my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I can go back and sit down. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. How's everyone's energy level? Good? All right. Um, First of all, I come from a regional project based out of Bangkok. I'm very used to speaking after Jack Hurd. Those of you who know Jack Hurd, now I have the privilege of going after Lex. So uh, I am also a friend of the Nature Conservancy. I used to work uh, for the Nature Conservancy for several years under the RAF program, uh, helping some of the models that uh, Lex just alluded to on reduced impact logging plus carbon. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in Vietnam at the moment. If you look at, at me, I don't look very Vietnamese, and I apologize for that. We were supposed to have a colleague of mine uh, from VN Forest actually present the national level, and I was going to present the provincial level equivalent to what's happening at the national level. Unfortunately, he was unable to join us. Uh, he wears two hats, one for the VN Forest, uh, the red unit, as well as now the uh, government counterpart for UN Red Phase 2. So he's a, a quite a busy man. So he sends his apologies. Uh, that means you have the unfortunate privilege of hearing me try to represent both sides of the picture here. And I, I will do my best, but I am definitely not an expert on Vietnam national policies. So um, with that precursor, uh, let me just say that what's happening in Vietnam is is quite a unique endeavor. Uh, they've learned from uh, a PFES experience, uh, that's uh, payment for forest ecosystem services, which was initialized under another USAID-funded program, uh, ARBCP. 
The, they actually, over the last few years, have recognized that decentralization is quite a unique um, and opportune uh, Vietnamese context. Um, in particular, for them, they have what's called a socioeconomic development plan and a forest protection development plan, which are done at the provincial level. And that Red Plus provides a unique opportunity to, to align within those two planning cycles, the same kind of provincial red action plan as Lex alluded to is also, um, and our colleague from Indonesia is happening here in 11 different parts, 11 different sites or provinces in Indonesia. Um, there's a recognition that within those planning cycles that these may actually be separate documents, standalone documents, or that the PRAP would be an actual annex to those documents. I don't really care, personally, how it comes out, but um, I personally think that the voluntary aspects of PFAS have been very interesting in Vietnam. The, the quote unquote voluntary components, I put it in quotes here because when the Vietnamese government asks a provincial government, please do this, uh, it's voluntary. The reality is the, the governments actually do turn around and do it. So the planning cycles, while they are indeed uh, mandatory, Red Plus is very much uh, voluntary at this point. Uh, any country that doesn't want Red Plus doesn't have to take Red Plus. It's a, a voluntary mechanism at this point. Maybe maybe in, the, in 2020 we'll have a compliance-based regime, but uh, at least for now, the next point I want to talk about is, is about national forest inventories. Uh, sorry, go back. Yeah, national forest inventories, and I'll talk about the, the devolution of responsibility and the harmonization of data sets that's happening in Vietnam at the provincial level and what that means for the national context as the, the country goes through its national action plan. Uh, everything that we're doing in Lam Dong is a participatory approach, very similar to Burao. What we're trying to do is build capacity of the local institutions to take ownership of this PRAP process. It doesn't matter that I work for a project and we're providing technical inputs. We want to make sure that this PRAP process is owned by the government and is indeed a participatory approach. UN Red Phase 2, if you talk about uh, multiple sources of financing, right now UN Red Phase 2 is the primary mechanism that uh, the government is looking to finance six provinces and these provincial red action plans. Um, the site-based planning that uh, UN Red Phase 2 is implementing is actually testing out various strategies. Those are being done at the district level, and those were identified in UN Red Phase 1, Annex G, which districts were so-called low-hanging fruit, low-emission development strategies that they're trying to test uh, in this next phase. Next slide. Another area of very interesting dialogue right now going on at the national level is about the National Red Plus Fund, and what would a fund look like what would incentivize different sources of funding to come in, whether it be uh, bilateral or multilateral donors, the UNFCCC Red Plus mechanism, or even private sector financing uh, into this national red fund. And would that fund actually then disperse directly um, to the, the provinces or the districts where site-based activities are taking place, or would there need to be uh, subnational funds actually set up for those disbursements. So there's a, a lot of interesting dialogue happening right now. Uh, LEAF is providing technical support, so is UN Red and UNDP on the dialogue that needs to happen at the national level, but also at the provincial level because it will affect uh, how disbursements are, are distributed. Uh, the overheads, of course, uh, with, with a national fund and the overheads affiliated with multiple provincial funds. Those are all issues that are being discussed this, uh, this month, next month in, in Vietnam. We hope to have a decision fairly soon. Next slide, please. Um, the other recognition is that there are local agents of change. Next slide, please. We've actually looked in Lam Dong province at, uh, using a forest cover change assessment 
What are the drivers of deforestation? What are the drivers of degradation? Here's a list of some of them for Lamdong Province. Next slide, please. I mentioned that this is a participatory approach. There's a lot of capacity building that, that has, uh, has taken place in terms of building up the institutions that are needed at the subnational uh, sub level for Red Plus to really function. The Provincial Red Action Plan, as I mentioned, is a planning document. So it, at, at first, is, uh, has got a framework that's been approved by the provincial government. And uh, there's a timeline here for UN Red Phase 2 and for LEAF to provide technical inputs. But the government wants this PRAP to be completed by December 2014, exactly when the national PRAP, sorry, the national RAP, National Red Action Plan will be finalized. I don't have a timeline there, but I can tell you that what's happening in Lamdong is actually driving what's happening at the national level. Next slide, please. This is uh, similar to what Lex called a, a broader framework. This is a broader framework that we are using across uh, various provincial and district level interventions across uh, the LEAF portfolio of countries to look at a low emission framework. At, at the Lamdong site, we are basically, I know this is hard to read, but we're basically gone through the first three steps of this cycle and we're, we've gone through the uh, stakeholder consultations, the uh, environmental, social, and economic data needs, uh, gap analysis, the capacity building around those data sets, and we've gotten to the, the point of actually modeling uh, different interventions to see what the province can come up with in terms of emission reductions by using its existing socioeconomic development plan and its forest protection development plan, as well as adding Red Plus interventions into those existing plans. So this is a scenario planning exercise that we're doing uh, with the provincial government, and it's been quite useful for them to look at various scenarios and figure out which interventions they may want to put into their PRAP and which interventions they perhaps will, will uh, push on for some later day. When, the, when financing may be, uh, when may be there. The, the idea here is that in, in the absence of carbon finance, we want to have good land use planning and we want to have good interventions irrespective of whether they're going to be financed or not. So this is a, the very important part of this framework is getting the buy-in from the local government that the good land use planning that they're going, going through right now is a good investment for them irrespective of whether Red Plus materializes or not. Next slide, please. Here are some decisions that have been made at the provincial level. I mentioned that uh, what's happening at the provincial level is really driving the national level discourse. So some of the discussions are uh, things like the definition of what is a forest, what are the pools and gases that are gonna be measured, uh, the link to the national forest inventory. Obviously, yes, uh, we wanna make sure those things are linked. Uh, the time is running, so next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned the National Forest Inventory. We want to harmonize, basically, the data sets. There's two separate data sets that are involved in land use planning in, in Vietnam. One is a forest stratification data set, and the other one is more about land use demarcations, if you will. Uh, so we want to make sure those are harmonized, so we're talking amongst the various ministries about the same landscape with the same overall stratification. The NFI certainly is, is useful for that, but we, we have to recognize that it, it's not the end in all, in all cases. Next slide, please. Some examples of activities. Um, this is similar to Lex's slide, some interventions that are being considered in the province and uh, specifically where in the province are looking at these. Next slide, please. And then the measurement and monitoring. Um, I think that uh, what's happening right now is in the absence of a national system, the provinces are taking an active role of doing at least the monitoring. Uh, the national level measurement system is in place, but the monitoring for emission factors as well as activity data is starting to happen at the provincial level to quantify what the carbon emission uh, benefits from various strategies in that particular province. So that's a very important uh, 
let's just call it reality check of what the emission reduction opportunities may be in that province. Next slide, please. So some quick challenges. Uh, Lex, I still got a minute. Thanks. Um, the, I mentioned the National Red Fund will need to con consider the benefits and funding flows and whether to set up these sub-national bodies and the overheads uh, affiliated with those administrative bodies. Uh, what type of grievance mechanism will there be if someone doesn't like uh, the process? FPIC wasn't quite enough and uh, they're upset with the, the deal that the district or the commune already lined up for them. How do you go about a grievance mechanism? Is that going to be a national mechanism? Is it going to be a subnational mechanism? These are issues that need to be resolved fairly quickly. Um, we can talk a little bit about nesting architecture, what the implications are for looking at nesting as opposed to a, um, a subnational level approach, as, as Lex called it. So these are some of the challenges. Um, we're working through this. The government, I should say, is working through this in Vietnam. And it's a very interesting time for them because they're learning a lot from their, their neighboring countries and, and vice versa. And, uh, you know, ironically, we as a, a regional program, we're focused on sharing lessons learned. I feel like a lot of the lessons learned are not at the national level, they're not at the regional level, they're at this subnational level. So this is really where the rubber meets the road and that's where we need to focus on effective low emission land use planning, what is working, what's not working, and uh, happy to take questions when we finish the panel. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, David. Now, our final speaker is Mike Dwyer from C4. So thank you everybody for sticking it out this late in the day. Um, I'm not going to be presenting results from a specific project, so in that sense I have the advantage of having a lot less evidence to get through, so I hope we can get into discussion relatively quickly. Um, I want to return to one of the issues that um, has come up in a couple of the presentations, which is framing and definitions, um, because in doing some scoping for this, we've had conversations among ourselves about the extent to which this is red focused versus more general uh, conversations about jurisdictional authority over land use and land uh, land use decision making and if you talk to people in Laos who are working on these issues you tend to get fairly different answers if you frame it in terms of red and if you focus within red on jurisdictional approaches you tend to get answers of the sort that say well there's been a lot of groundwork in the sense of laying plans but a lot of things are really up in the air the National Red Task Force met in January. They're meeting, I think, again tomorrow. And a lot of the actual decision making will, as far as jurisdictional based red, will flow from decisions that have yet to be made or at least shared. Um, so, in that sense, there's a lot that is still very uncertain, as Lex was talking about, and questions uh, remain about, uh, ab about what is yet to be, both not only internationally, but locally as well. On the other hand, if you talk to people about anything that's not red specific, but related to jurisdictional control over land use, and specifically district and provincial scale decision making, you can get a torrent of information and people will talk to you about that for days, weeks, hours. Um, uh, there, there's a lot to talk about. Um, and so in that sense, Laos has been going through some of the types of discussions, policy makings, and uh, some uh, intra and inter-institutional inter struggles and cross-scalar debates about the, ve the very kinds of issues that ultimately shape the outcomes of these kinds of projects. And that has been in the works for, I would say, over 10 years. And I'll show you a timeline in a minute that will help, it's gonna help put some of these things in context. Um, so what I wanna do is to start out by giving just um, kind of a quick, 15 year history or so, which shows red as the latest in a, in a longer discussion about the relationship between uh, national level policy and the decision making over land use choices by uh, provincial and district governments. Um, and then focus uh, even more quickly on two areas for um, 
collaboration to watch as, uh, as things unfold in the future. So first slide, please. So what you see here is just very quickly, um, basically 20 years of the development of zoning type legibility at the national scale when it comes to Laos's forests. 1983, you have very loosely defined areas where the state forest enterprises were doing production forests. Um, 19 in 1993, you have the establishment of Laos's protected area system, which you see in red. Um, then formalizing the production, the, for, the, the timber production activities that had been going on within the state forest enterprises, you have the gazetting of production forests, which as far as I know was really only publicized in map-based form around 2006, 2007. And then you really have over the last couple of years seen a real flurry of filling in the white spots on the map um, in what I would call the era of red. And that's where you see these uh, uh, blue areas, which uh, as you might have heard from the uh, vice minister's presentation this morning, now, now number about six and a half million hectares. In 2010, they numbered about three and a half million hectares. So really within the last three years, you've had a massive gazetting of state forests as part of the, I would say, as part of the red planning process. Um, putting these in context, I want to argue that there's a lot of this process is a response to, decent to uh, decentralized both as a, as a fact and also to some extent as a process, decision making over land use. So the national economic mechanism generally dated in the late 1980s involved among other things the devolution of control over state forest enterprises and specifically the capital and facilities involved in timber production and logging to provincial level authorities. Um, one of the problems that that then created was a logging boom in the late 90s, which the formalization of both conservation and production forest areas over the next couple of years was the first sort of regulatory pushback on that. There was a very important decree in 1996 that's the first instance of uh, a process that is still going on today and that's driving Laos's national land policy development process, which has been going on since 2012. And that is an effort to formalize the process of granting concessions. So concessions have been very much in the news since 2004, 5, 6 in Laos because of the concession boom. But actually, the efforts by the central government to formalize the process so as to control it a little bit more date back to the mid-90s. The land, use, the land and forest allocation program, for those of you who know the situation in Laos, um, has been a village scale zoning process that has created a whole other level of maps that I'm not showing here that exist in many villages and in some places are still around and in other places have been forgotten, but that adds another layer to this zoning process which has to be worked out when you get down to uh, localized uh, implementation of jurisdiction and including but not only red type projects. In many ways, that was also a response to try to formalize the process of land use a little bit more. And then just to close out uh, this line the, of this first point, there have been three moratoria that have been issued on land concessions since 2007. One in 2000, first in 2007, um, the second in 2009, which was uh, rolled out only a few weeks after the previous moratorium was lifted, indicating quite a bit of ongoing debate. And then again in 2012, a third moratorium. So there's this ongoing conversation which is now in the process of being formalized in the re rewriting of the land law, the rewriting of the forest law, and the development of a national land use policy, all of which are wrestling with the question of control over land use decision making by different levels within the nested jurisdictional control over land in Laos. It's not specific to RED, but RED is very much wrapped up in this. And so if you talk to people who are working in the RED world, they will tell you we've taken this quite a, quite a bit, but we have to wait on the national land policy process because that is driving what happens next at the provincial level. Next slide, please. So this is uh, a, a quote that I'm going to read from a RED specific jurisdictional approach, but that I think resonates in a, in, in, a, in a very specific way in the context of these ongoing debates about the, uh, the control over decision making of land use. So under a jurisdictional approach, this is here, here we see the tension between 
jurisdictions as a measurement area versus jurisdictions as a, as a governance area, it will be necessary for the govern of, government of Laos to take a much greater role than under the previous project level approach. The program must be seen as an approach demanded and undertaken by the province itself. For, and for such an approach to work, outside assistance must break free of its project image and be seen as supporting and backstopping government-led initiative. High levels of provincial leadership and ownership of this new approach are thereby necessary in order to achieve performance. This is recognizing just the importance that provincial level authority plays in driving all of the decision making that RED and the wider national land use policy process is trying to deal with. Next slide, please. So I'm going to close with two areas to watch um, for, actually, previous slide, just without the text. Yeah, thanks. Um, before I get to those two issues, this is just uh, a slight zoom in on the northern part of the landscape that I showed you before with an approximate uh, configuration of the degree of spatial precision that uh, we're starting to see in specifically the red world in Laos. There's a very large jurisdictional area that you can see in the solid uh, polygon that covers much of four provinces. This is an area that uh, is being developed with uh, World Bank money from the forest investment program and that is working in the production forests and in the uh, national biodiversity conservation areas and the watershed protection forests and the non-forest areas um, to do various types of interventions. The other two areas in the dotted lines are two of the projects that started out at project scale and have scaled up or in the process of scaling up to jurisdiction-based approaches focus on, focusing on coordination at the provincial level but probably focusing their interventions at specific districts where the greatest types of impacts can be had. Next slide, please. And then the, finally, the two areas that I think are especially important to watch. First is the um, relationship between spatial transparency with respect to investment and the ability to calculate different development scenarios and therefore counterfactuals to what's actually observed. This is a, a um, tra transparency in concessions goes back to that 1996 uh, decree that I was talking about and the effort to formalize concession making and have a documentary uh, evidence base that is then shared within government and uh, can then be used in order to help understand previous patterns of land use change. One of the major challenges in doing reference emission levels is differentiating between what is likely to happen in, in the future because it's planned and what's likely to happen uh, in the future because it's unplanned and the types of data that are available to the people who are doing the calculations will have a major impact on the degree to which those reference emissions levels can be calculated in, uh, in convincing ways. And I think there are probably many, many ways to do it. All of the, the point is that the degree to which the process can be populated with real data on land use concessions, uh, I'm sorry, on land concessions for um, investment is not something that can be taken for granted um, and it's something that people will probably have to push for in order to make the, the counterfactual scenarios more convincing and therefore the impacts more convincing. The second thing to watch is um, the debate about the formalization of property rights that's been going on for some years. It's been especially strong in Cambodia. It's uh, trickled over into Laos and this is the question about where land titling happens, when and why. Um, one of the major things that's come with the RED agenda and specifically with the jurisdictional approach to RED, which is now targeting areas outside the forest estate, is the formalization of communal title. And so this is a process that's been piloted in the Numpton 2 hydropower project area, but there's not really consensus as to whether a sufficient legal basis exists in Laos to keep going forward with this. But this is the type of thing that provincial and district authorities can have a major influence on. And uh, in, terms of ev in terms of experiences, you see things going both ways. Um, so I want to keep it brief, so I'll say these, these are just things to watch as things go forward. Thanks. OK, thanks very much, Mike. Well, we've had um, four very good presentations which have raised um, a host of issues. And I just want to touch on, on a couple of them before I open up to the audience. Um, I think, Mike, you may be really responsible for making sure that RED at a jurisdictional le level is actually um, 
is actually implemented. So you've also raised the point about conflicting tenure challenges there, and, and, and others of you have raised points about you know, the need to manage conflict between different groups. Where a government is, is really the interface between, um, between jurisdiction or red, how does a government ensure that it's actually able to represent all of the stakeholders within a particular jurisdictional approach when you have, for example, in Indonesia, constitutional court decisions about adapt community rights. So I'm interested, when you're looking at a project-based activity, the parameters are fairly defined, but when you move to a, to a jurisdictional approach and a go governments who are not tr traditionally in the business of overseeing many, many individual moving parts of a project, how does a government actually implement that? Um, any of you feel should we feel free to, to respond? Lex, do you want to kick off? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Really, is the key question. I mean, to what degree can any particular jurisdiction control uh, land use, control management outcomes? Um, you know, as I think Mike did a great job of putting red in the context of a long discussion, and in Indonesia it's absolutely the same, you know, where the decentralization process has been unfolding, the you know, recognition of adat rights has been unfolding, the spatial planning regulations, et cetera, and, you know, policies on how uh, licenses are given out and who gets to check on those things um, have been evolving. And so I think, <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to emphasize there with, with you know, working, on, working through, and to me, on these management outcomes, you know, that, that, that at a jurisdictional level or within a country, it'll probably be pretty consistent across that, you know, they need to f get to the point eventually where uh, it's clear who can control those management outcomes. And it's gonna, to me, it's unlikely it'll ever be 100%, you know, granted over to any particular jurisdiction, but that you might have enough clarity uh, about the roles that you could make a range of multi-stakeholder agreements to say, look, you know, for the purposes of this project in this time period, you know, the national level is going to stop giving mining concessions within this jurisdiction because they have this agreement, you know. And if so, if you can get the different management outcomes that matter clarified, I think you can package them up in a way, um, you know, that allows a jurisdiction to make an agreement, even though, you know, they don't get full control. One by one, of the, you know, at, at a single time. It's more of a composition of multiple kind of arrangements. That's the way I would tend to see it. Yeah, thank you. I think I just want to adding what the point already uh, mentioned by Lex, especially like when we talk about Red Plus in Indonesia. Uh, relation between national government and subnational government. I think the jurisdictional approach is one of the opportunity how we can involve the local government in the whole discussion of the Red Plus. If uh, the colleagues who are familiar with Indonesian context in the beginning of the Red Plus development in Indonesia, there's a lot of critics that Red Plus government, uh, Red Plus development is mainly happen only at the national level but not yet going into the subnational level and I think it's about time that we seriously taking some actions to involving more and more subnational government especially province and the districts in the red plus debate and I think this is one a good point to entering that and involving those uh, local government in the red plus uh, debate of course maybe when we talk about the approach or intervention to the field, it's, I think, I do believe that maybe brow uh, intervention or a program, it will be different, like what we have maybe in Jambi, for example, in Merangin district or Bungo districts. So the, the, the jurisdictional approach, I think also it can give opportunity that we can accommodate some uh, local specific aspects in the uh, provincial or districts. Thank you. Yeah, I just, um, I touched on what's needed to strengthen some of these local institutions and uh, you know, I also brought up the whole issue of a grievance mechanism, whether it's needed at a national level or a subnational level. And ironically, I asked uh, 
Teb Teba just two weeks ago in, in Hanoi, there was a global meeting of indigenous groups uh, funded by, by NORAD, um, but the Teb Teba group was, um, I asked them the same thing, well, do you have any concerns about how indigenous rights may or may not be taken into consideration with the development of subnational Red Plus strategies? And uh, ironically, the group came back to me and said, well, there's, there's plenty of United Nations grievance mechanisms that are already out there and are quite functional for, uh, for human rights issues. And um, there's really no, read for, no need for Red Plus to start its own new mechanism. But you know, this, this comes to, into place also with uh, national, social, and environmental safeguard systems. We, we have to figure out what exists out there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and if there's already good systems in place, uh, you know, I mentioned the, the NFI. How do you turn an NFI into a national forest monitoring system that is more inclusive of carbon and multiple benefits affiliated with, uh, with these interventions so that we're not just looking at, you know, above ground systems but below ground systems and different carbon pools. So these are things that I think uh, we typically like to say, oh, Red Plus needs this, Red Plus needs that, but I, I think there's plenty of existing mechanisms already out there. Um, I would echo that as well in um, just saying, I think the leverage that exists um, to shape the types of consultation processes and stakeholder processes are likely to come in through standards and safeguards because simply the, the message that's been coming out of the practitioner world has been coming up against walls uh, rather than making more suggestions of things that we can do. And I think that that message also comes out of the international policy uh, debate as well, where um, I heard this in the earlier session on investment, where um, the, the, I forget um, his name, but the, the man from, the, from the, the gold standard was saying it doesn't actually help when you get very spe country specific sets of standards and requirements for what has to happen, because then that starts to create credits that are not really comparable and tradable. But, but on that point, isn't that inevitable, given that California are having particular standards, gold standards different to the VCS? Isn't that like going to happen anyway? It's somewhat, yeah. And the, I think the, 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 an, the, the answer to that question when it was posed earlier was the standards are, they sort of need to come together to the extent that they can, and that's obviously an open question. Okay, um, in the presentation, all of you, I think, except maybe, maybe one, all of you talked about the World Bank and the World Bank financing. So I would like to put a, a hypothetical to you. Um, imagine you're, you're currently advising your government today um, and you're about to sign an LOI with the World Bank's FCPF. And the FCPF, if you have a look at the methodological framework and the LOI for Costa Rica, says that in signing that LOI, you will guarantee legal title to the carbon that flows to the bank and you'll guarantee a risk of reversal. And imagine in your jurisdiction you have challenges of illegal logging and things, uh, and, uh, and private companies taking forestry out. Do you think, think that any of the jurisdictions in which you've worked are in a position to sign an LOI today with, w w with the bank for a transfer of funds where you can guarantee that transfer of title and you can guarantee that risk of reversal? Sure. Um, this <laughs> either uh, either on a very small um, jurisdictional yep. jurisdiction, a very small, uh, and where, where's an example of where it, you could actually see that working now? Oh, I I was going to answer the question for a district where I, for a district where I worked, and that's not necessarily a district where I where I could see that working out. So I would say. Uh, plausibly, in the, to the extent that the district government actually does have a fair degree of control over how the timber gets used, how the timber decision making gets used, and the tenure uh, regimes get operationalized and rolled out. Um, I don't know that I would uh, advise them to sign it. Uh, well, obviously, the, certainly details would matter, but I would say, yes, the capacity could possibly exist. Um, but that's a very tentative 
but, but it reinforces the point that you made about the government being a backstop. Sure, and I think I, I, I would have expected your question to focus on if you were advising the national level government, what would you do? And to me, there the the choice is a lot. I would say it's mo much more of a gamble because the, the the national level government then has to essentially take a bet on the ability to rein in decision making by local governments. Um, and to me, that's that's the bigger challenge, at least from what I've seen so far. Uh, I want to Yeah, I think your question is very right, and I think uh, you as a lawyer can advise us later on. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, uh, to be honest, that uh, that's kind of questions that we need to answer when we saying that we are ready to submit our plan. Uh, and then make uh, local government understanding the consequences. But I do believe that as long as we put everything on the table, let's say, what's your plan about forest concessions? And then that's a part of the design in our jurisdictional approach. I think that's possible and workable for us. Of course, there's a lot of legality works need to be done in that context, but we have a lot of modalities to start with, especially, let's say, if we were uh, working at the district levels, so make sure that we put the design of the production forest. So that's why, like the Brow case showing KPH is one of the key intervention here because KPH also, or forest management unit is consists protection forest, production forest, concession forest. So everything is there. And then let's work under jurisdictional, as let's say, are we want to put it as accounting uh, unit or management unit, that's fine. And then makes uh, local government be part of that process is kind of the mechanism. Maybe guarantee is too strong language, but at least we can put that on our management plan. Yeah. Um. I think we, we're really talking about a subnational jurisdiction's ability to control forest loss or forest degradation in that jurisdiction. And in the case of Vietnam, there is a historical context with these socioeconomic development plans and these forest development protection plans where you can actually historically go back five years and see what they had set up in terms of that planning cycle what actually happened, the efficacy of that plan and the implementation of that plan. Because it's a command control system, there's a, a um, yeah, high level of confidence that when there's a plan put in place, it will get implemented. So from a you know, purely, yeah, I'm not representing the government, I'm <laughs> an outsider viewing this particular system in Vietnam, I would feel comfortable signing that LOI based on the historical context. I don't think you can do that in all the countries in Southeast Asia because you don't have a planning cycle that where uh, you can actually look at the five-year plan compared to what was actually allocated and implemented. Uh, there are certain countries you can do that, and um, I suggest we look carefully at the, the historical context in developing the reference level and how the planning cycle can be used as a, as a mechanism for designing future intervention strategies. You know, it does, and I think, I think a very good point is that a country like Vietnam is w where you have planning and you have more controls a lot easier than countries which have uh, conflicting claims over land and, <laughs> and, and possible contention. So I think it is, but yeah, true, but not to the same perhaps can degree. I, can I change my answer? Seriously, I've, I've been thinking, st stewing about it. I, I, I think that Viet, I think, uh, I don't know that much about Vietnam, but I would tend to agree with, with the kind of thing that David said. But I think that um, there's also a tendency to, to group Laos into that command and control box. And I don't really think that that applies in a lot of circumstances related to land use based decision making. The things that I was also thinking of is I think there would be, 
I think, again, the, the word guarantee is fairly strong, and I think there would be conflicts with the central level when it came to legally guaranteeing that, and I think that the conflict, conflicts with the province level would be potential, at least to the point of disrupting a guarantee when it came to the decisions over timber. Okay. Um, then I'll have one final question before I'll open to the audience. Um, I think, um, uh, David, you talked about the funding flows and, you, and, and setting up the fund in Vietnam um, for these funding flows. C can I ask all of you, given that most of the donor countries are saying that their commitments to RED are fairly much um, in terms of developing the frameworks but no more, where do you see the funding flows actually coming from to finance RED in the longer, t well, in the short or longer term, bearing in mind that at the project level at the moment, it's very difficult to get red finance. So at a jurisdictional level, where we're talking very large scale um, red or other activities, where do you see the funds flowing from to actually um, uh, finance those activities? Yeah, uh, I think for now, uh, we relying on the public fund. To be honest, that let's say two or three uh, years, let's say, or even next five years, that we will uh, depend on the public fund. But like in Indonesia case, we uh, develop the scenario when uh, the trajectory that public fund will be diminishing. That's why public fund become the main thing because in these stages, we uh, preparing a lot of uh, infrastructures for it plus implementation and things. It's not so interesting for private funds to be part of that because this is part of the investment of the governments need to be there. So in our scenario also, it's we not only depend on the donor fund, but also our domestic fund must be part of that investment. And yeah, like let's say, uh, cooperation between us and Norway is a part of that public fund support. But in our scenario, when we de uh, designing uh, our funding instruments, we hope that the next five years, maybe it's like 80% of funds from the private fund. But the key question is like, how we can make that investment on this kind of sectors in Indonesia is the interesting one. Because when you talk about incentive, you talk about you talk, if you talk about investment, you talk about the performance, the result base, and I think that will be the key for uh, attracted new funds outside of the public funds. Thank you. Well, I can just revert back to my slide because I had three sources of funding there. One was the multilateral bilateral mechanisms which are currently functioning. The second one was the future compliance mechanism and the third one was private sector and I don't think we spend enough time uh, whether it's discussing carbon financing in, in relation to Red Plus or a low emission development strategy, green growth strategy, discussing the private sector and, and in particular how to incentivize the private sector to make investments that are compatible with what the trajectory or the, let's just call it green growth strategy for that province or that district. So I think the, um, you know, the, the decisions that are being made at a national level on, on where the funding could come from is, uh, is an interesting one in the, in the case of Vietnam. Um, they've made it quite explicit that they, they don't see domestic uh, trading system as a, as a potential future mechanism to fund uh, their low emission development strategies. But I think that a lot of emerging economies uh, in this region need to be thinking about domestic sources of funding um, to promote their green growth strategies and not just expect bilateral, multilateral, or a, a compliance regime to fund these, these uh, commitments. Um, so I, you know, I think there are some examples um, in China. I know uh, Malaysia and Thailand have talked about it, but there there is one case in the in southwestern China, and the TNC folks in the room could probably speak to it better than I can, of where they're looking to uh, a domestic emission trading system to help finance 
their green growth strategy and their emission reduction commitments. Yeah, I would just echo what uh, Park Yuan said. I mean, I think <clears throat> at the risk of sounding naive, I do think that there are lots of opportunities to, to protect forests in a way, you know, protect forests that are in the interest of Indonesian stakeholders without extra financing. And I imagine that's true in other places where either communities rely on forests for certain needs and to the extent that they're given authority to protect that, that they'll be protected. You know, that, that there are forests which have incredibly valuable watershed protection services associated with them and that if the, that information is well understood and incorporated into decisions, you would see a significant expansion of, of areas that are protected. Um, and I do think that, like David said, you know, pushing on the private sector. You know, there's been a lot of commitments, you know, about deforestation, free palm oil, et cetera. Um, so far, it's not clear to me that, you know, a company saying we're going to commit to deforestation free palm oil is also going to contribute to protecting carbon stocks. You can do one without leading to the other, and that's a huge challenge. And I think that, you know, governments and consumers you know, can start pushing on that to try to translate and say, look, if you want to be part of this deforestation free palm oil, it means protecting carbon stocks also. And so if that happens, you know, based on those commitments or, you know, expanded commitments, um, I think that's a big opportunity. And I also think compensation for, for impacts, you know, sort of net positive impact commitments that companies are starting to make could have a big influence. You know, in the long term of climate finance, uh, yeah, I think we have to be a lot more creative because the market opportunities of you know, starting to look a little thin. Yeah, I think I just forgot one point that when we talk about market, usually we look outside, and then we talk about the pot, uh, financial potential. We also look to the international donors, but like the case for Indonesia, we not yet properly discussing about the potential to get fund from the domestic market. Let's say for the private sectors. There's a lot of big companies that actually, if we try to take a look their emission architectures, maybe they can be part of the company who uh, must reduce their emission domestically. And but this is also need a political decision from the government. Let's say for the next government to saying like have a decision to create demand domestically, saying like 50% of Indonesian re emission reduction maybe must be uh, achieved from domestic sources. So it's a create demand. And then after that, the company can, or private sectors can moving and doing some investment related with that. But again, this is a need the big step, uh, political uh, decisions, and of course, a very good uh, policy works to make these things possible. But if you're asking about where is the potential, we not only talk about the international potential, but also domestic potential. So we need to doing this kind of, uh, works like analysis or doing some policy works how to make things happen and i think the example of that is in china three of the um, three of the pilot schemes do in fact encompass domestic forestry carbon or are planning to do so okay um we've got about 10 minutes left so i just might open it to the floor for any questions you've got of the panelists Um, and we've been working for the past few years in jurisdictional red as well, um, but we have observed a lot of tensions between the national and subnational governments. And it has uh, to do with many different uh, reasons. Uh, some reasons are the subnational governments or jurisdictions can move faster sometimes than the national government and can make decisions uh, faster. Um, sometimes uh, national governments want to move forward with red and, and trying to push jurisdictions to move forward, but they are not ready. So, I mean, it's uh, different reasons. But um, I just want to ask you if you have any lessons learned on how to deal with these ten tensions, because we, I believe that we were, we're going to be seeing this a lot um, in, in terms of benefit sharing as well when we move forward to phase three. And the other question I have is uh, to Iwan. Uh, you said that the uh, Indonesia government has narrowed down now to seven districts. Um, to move forward uh, probably with an ERP into the carbon fund, uh, but seven are too much uh, to, to, to work with and to submit to the carbon fund. There are too many districts. So um, what is the plan to narrow down to a lower number? And uh, ask you if you plan to submit to the carbon fund uh, in the meeting in June or, or later in September. And happy birthday to Iwan. <laughs> Okay. 
Yeah, uh, firstly, thank you for the birthday uh, notes. Uh, yeah, uh, when we start uh, the process, we started with like more than 20 districts out of five provinces. And then we narrowing down into seven. And then last week, we tried to narrowing down like to three or two or three districts. But there's a good point from those districts coming, like when we coming back to our government that saying like we not succeed, we are not part of the scheme, those districts will be disappointed and the head of the district will say, forget it, Red Plus. We will not talk about Red Plus anymore because it's not real, it's a wasting time. So that's kind of the quote unquote consensus among us. Let's make this seven district fly in our ERP because we uh, selected this district with certain criteria based on the carbon fund criteria and also that even there's analogy from uh, those district representatives saying like seven district is too many. No, if you're comparing to out of 500 districts. So that's the mandate that we have that they're requesting us to please working with the seven districts. The challenge is huge especially due to the uh, time frame what we have. And then we also need to open a public consultation later on, which is there's a lot of criticism on this. But we uh, will saying that, yeah, let's work in with the seven districts and let's see how far we can move. And uh, let's find a way on that. And we working on a more optimistic way, like we can work with the seven districts because the seven district is not started from zero at least for the flopping reference emission level, they have some data, they already started with that. So uh, we can work in with the seven districts. But if your question like, is it economically more viable? Maybe it can be yes or no. But what we aiming now is like to get more district on board, working on the Red Plus, that's more important rather than just like, let's say working two or two districts to make it more uh, substantial chunk of incentive, for example. So yeah, it's a challenge for us, but we have no options. We're working on that because this is the mandate and agreement we got from uh, those district from four provinces. Thank you. Um, my quick answer to that is I think just based on my experience, I think uh, that when you have conflicts between national level and local level governments, it's often about money. And I would suggest posing the question of tenure and the types of taxes and revenues that come out of land ownership. And it's sort of a perpendicular approach to the question, but I think that by bringing up those issues, you might get actual movement on the types of things that are at stake if they are economic. And if they're not, then that should come out in the process too. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think, uh, you know, ex thinking about it as a sort of a negotiation where there's a bunch of interests on each side, like expanding the list of interests that you're talking about and being honest about the scope of things that really come into that complicated discussion. I mean, it could help um, to, to get that t sort of cooperation going. Okay, um, Gabriel, I think. Hi guys, um, I wanted to just uh, take a moment to recognize Lex and TNC and Barao for really being at the forefront of, of, uh, of jurisdictional work on RED. I think it's, it's great and um, it paved the way for a lot of other people uh, working in the area. Um, interestingly, you know, as we see developments occurring in, ju in jurisdictional work, um, we get in 2012, we start to see standards coming out from BCS, from American Carbon Registry, from, from other places. And uh, as, as we were talking about earlier, we're now even starting to see a development of those standards themselves beginning to merge when you look at um, the MF under FCPF and kind of the dialogue that's happening. So I think when, when Burrell first started out, one of the big questions was where do we begin? What's the methodology? What's, how do we approach these things? And now we have these standardized approaches the, that are being recognized and, and converging. So I'm curious from the panel, what, what, 
what do you see as the role of these standards um, for jurisdictional programs going forward, uh, especially in Indonesia, given the context where Indonesia really wants to create its own thing, but also lives in a world where they want the, the, the credits or the commodities or the ERRs that are being created to be internationally recognized? Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I think that they're extremely important. You know, I mean, uh, you know, we've been involved with the FCPF for a long time. We're investors in the Carbon Fund. You know, we've been heavily involved in the development of the methodological framework and tracking that in, in various places. You know, I think, you know, now the Brow is potentially going to be one of the places that uh, is included in Indonesia's submission. You know, it'll be a great chance to get serious. And I think it's a, you know, it's an incredible learning by doing to see what, how big is the gap, really. Between um, you know, doing expectations, you know, which I think the FCPF I think reflects international expectations pretty well. So trying to put that on the ground, you know, and having to be detailed and having to go through that, it's incredibly valuable. You know, I think you know we've been thinking about that about VCS uh, and whether we can support Brow and, and moving to, in those directions, you know, over the last couple of years. And you know, I've been hesitant because of the fact that Indonesia has been, you know, still in the process of developing its own kind of approach about how to provinces and what's the role of provinces, what's the role of districts, and really not, I mean, our goal is to help support the development of national programs, so running off and, you know, seizing an opportunity to sell credits from a jurisdiction, even though it would be a great learning experience, you know, it's only great if it's done together with the central government, and so I think now that, uh, you know, the Red Agency, the Ministry of Forestry have decided they want to go ahead with the FCPF, it's a great opportunity. And I think, you know, the smart thing, kind of as you're mentioning, is would be to sort of in some way incorporate the, some of the JNR stuff into that process as well, even if it's not part of the ultimate documents. I think it could be a really good learning opportunity. Yeah, I think so, continuing uh, from that is like, yeah, le learning by doing is a safe answer. That, yeah, but the reality is we are on that stage now. Uh, even like uh, beside what, when we talk about the model of uh, following carbon fund, of course, in terms of methodology, we will following the standard on that carbon fund. That's one model. The other models, like what the BPRED plus one uh, developing, is like how we will developing jurisdictional approach at the provincial context. I think it will be totally different things like what we have in the district level. Maybe in terms of like the number, it will be more simple because let's say we're dealing with 11 provinces rather than like, like 60 districts. But given the authority of the provinces more on the coordinating, maybe like having a function like a registry or like aggregating emission from the districts at the provincial level, maybe workable at the provincial. So we, uh, for now, we will uh, developing several approaches related with that. Because another challenge now is like how we will put the, especially the recent development of the forest management unit or KPH in the whole design of the forest governance in Indonesia. The interesting part from the jurisdictional approach is like you can touch the area of forest outside of legally decided as a forest. That's one of the, uh, the, the, the additional uh, point from jurisdictional. So yeah, we still struggling on like, is it district the best options, provincial, or like we can combining all of those, depend on the situation, on the districts, on the province. Thank you. I just have a cracker. Um, one of the issues is that the, is that the VCS and VCUs are the default mechanisms for red. So if you want to finance red at the moment and you want to get private sector to buy it, the VCS is really the major play in town. Um, one of the challenges then becomes is that if you put over the top of that um, a jurisdictional approach on projects that have already occurred, to what extent are those projects grandfathered? Um, will the jurisdictional government grandfather them or will the VCS allow them to sit side by side? The VCS will not allow them to sit by, side by side if the jurisdictional government is also claiming that. So where we may see real challenges is, is I see in two areas. One is where you have a jurisdictional approach and that jurisdiction sells the carbon to someone like the FCPF under that arrangement or, 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 or sells the results. 
and then somebody wants to do a jurisdictional red project, you can't double sell the carbon, and you, or you can't double sell the result, which, which is one problem. The second problem is where um, you, ha you actually have a national government try to do something, but the, the land is owned by the state government. So the national government wants to do a jurisdictional approach, but the state's saying, well, actually, we can do a, a VCS project right now and get, a, get someone to buy those credits immediately, and that sort of conflict arises. So I think those are the sorts of issues that just haven't really been, d um, d um, I, I guess, thought through yet. We'll have to wait and see how that's played out. I think we've got time for one more question. There's a gentleman up the back there. All right, I know it's uh, getting late, so I'll make this real quick. My name is Luke Pritchard, and I'm with the Governor's Climate and Forest Fund. And the GCF is an association or a network of 19 subnational jurisdictions that have been working pretty hard over the past five years on Red Plus and just generally low emission development efforts. And I think if you look at some of these subnational jurisdictions, and as some of the p panelists have talked about, talked about, they're really the quick movers. They're the ones that have achieved the most over the last five to 10 years. I think what we've seen in jurisdictions in Brazil has been probably the greatest climate achievement of our generation. And yet, as we look at climate finance, particularly related to Red Plus, it's almost all gone to the national level. So our jurisdictions haven't seen much in terms of capacity building, certainly little to nothing in terms of results-based payments. And we haven't seen a lot of results from what's gone to these national level governments that money has been slow to be mobilized and we just haven't seen much. So I'm wondering, just conceptually moving forward, if the donor community, which is really driving things right now, needs to perhaps reassess. And I'm not saying that, we, we obviously know national governments are important, but we know that it's taking a lot longer than we anticipated. And if perhaps more financial incentives and flows and capacity building efforts need to occur at the subnational level um, and just kind of if that's going to require a shift in paradigm from the donor community. Even if we look at the FCPF Carbon Fund, they're looking at subnational areas, but those agreements are all being signed with national governments, and we don't know how much of that's actually going to go down to the jurisdictions. Leave it to Luke to ask the tough questions at the end of the day. Um, you know, in, in the case of UN Red Phase 2, it's pretty clear that the, the work is focused on six provinces. And while there's national capacity building, it's really focused to build the right local institutions for the PRAP process to really materialize, lead to implementation, and then hopefully there'll be a Phase 3 which will then finance a lot of the implementation plans. Or, you know, the phase two is more about testing out strategies. So I, I, I agree with you, you know, to some degree that, um, you know, the nice analogy I like to make, given that I'm from California, um, is that, uh, and Andrea, you could probably speak to this better than anyone, you know, it took a long time for the, the California cap and trade program to, to get up and running. And now that it is running, people are like, wow, this is, this is great. Why, you know, why wasn't there a national system at the same time? Well, initially the intent by Governor Schwarzenegger was to push the agenda so that there would be a national system. And, um, you know, fortunately in the United States, there's enough state sovereignty uh, that this system can actually continue to run. Um, and to my knowledge, there's not that many uh, lawsuits going to the federal court, basically suing the, the, the state government for creating this new uh, cap and trade mechanism. I think that uh, in a lot of the countries, you, you mentioned early movers, um, these pro provinces, states, districts, whatever jurisdictional unit you have, they are pushing the envelope in a similar way to what California, you know, was doing and is doing. And I, I uh, also came from the Brow School of Training before I joined uh, USAID's LEAF program, and I always felt like the rubber met the road or needs to meet the road at the subnational level, and that's where we're going to have some significant gains in ter terms of low emission uh, strategies, uh, you know, proper land use planning, so forth, and um, 
you know, hopefully the governments, whether they're the ones signing the agreements or not, they're, they're recognizing that there is a specific need at this time frame to incentivize those early movers to make sure they don't all of a sudden lose all hope in, in uh, Red Plus or, or their green growth strategy. I'll just pick up on one point there. I think Red is, I think we probably underestimate. Red is extremely complicated. It involves many new concepts. It deals with many things that haven't really been been implemented at domestic levels before. Um, it also um, th there's also an expectation that 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 land tenure and other issues will just be resolved, which isn't the case. So it's a long process, and I think if you take the view that you know we're building on what we've learned today, projects and then a subnational and national level. The reality at the end of the day is that every red project must be implemented at a very small localised level. I mean, I think one of you was talking about at the village level. That's really where it has to be done. So the real thing that we've got to avoid is what ultimately is, is a failure of, of integrity and activity. So if people are trying to rush national level too fast and it ends up that, 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 that there's large scale re, um, reversals and there's, not, and there's large scale conflicts, th then you'll end up actually harming the whole process of jurisdictional red. So we need to do do it, do it in a sort of myth, mythological and, and careful manner. I think. Um, all right. Given it's quite well, quite over time, I'll, I'm going to end it there. I want to thank very much, Ewan, particularly on your birthday, for for being here, David, Mike, and Lex. And I also particularly want to thank TNC who have who, who have sponsored the the today's session. And thanks very much to, to Lex for putting it all together. Um, finally, I've just got a, an announcement here to make um, from the conference organisers, which is that. Uh, f following this event at, at 7 to 8 tonight in the Java room, um, the FAO uh, ha have, a, have a side event. It's, um, the side event will inform participants of the key findings of the first state of the world's forest genetic resources report, which, be, which will be released in, in the summer 2014, and the associated global plan of action for the conservation, sustainable use and development of forest genetic r resources. So that's on um, in five minutes in the Java room for those who are interested. Okay, um, can I just ask you to thank all the panellists for their contribution today?